so when we talk about sustainability i think large part of the conversation is restricted to what is the data center doing or what is the company doing mm-hmm. okay to ensure that the data center is sustainable mm-hmm. okay yeah. uh, i think it's unfair to do that uh, hpc demands a new level of understanding compared to conventional computer technology uh, where can practitioner go to learn about this complexity for example pawisno can you explain about it mm. you need to you know you need to find how the sla how big the sla mm. how provide the continuity sustainability your data center right mm-hmm. that's the point how do they solve the problem that depends upon who is sitting behind the kvm to solve the problem i see mm-hmm. okay so if you put me behind the kvm problem will never be solved <laughs> oh. <laughs> since you are behind this, this all, all the time right okay. <laughs> in the certain point that we might need to reduce mm. everything yeah yeah i agree with you mm. right mm. everything not only the technology mm. not only the uh, the cost the consumption mm. again we facing also the the dc provider facing also the issue how to reduce the human let's move to cooling methods and efficiency oh, now okay okay so there question on the rising level of power being used also means more heat is generated this means adopting an efficient cooling method is uh, very crucial i heard liquid cooling to be the next trend until 2027 what separates it from other cooling methods for example Okay so uh it's not only Lagrange I think the world predicts it uh that liquid cooling will be the future technology for cooling in data mm-hmm. centers yeah. okay there is no running away from it yeah. but I think uh one needs to approach uh, cooling in a slightly more uh, logical manner mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay uh, you go back uh, 10 to 12 years ago uh, we were cooling what you call the room the parameter mm-hmm. okay the whole room was being cooled and we were keeping the temperatures at about 18 degrees 19 mm-hmm. degrees okay. then uh, as efficiency started kicking in and people wanted to reduce their operational costs and electricity bills and then they wanted to uh, start managing the uh, air you know mm-hmm. airflow movement etc mm-hmm. you can get into precision cooling you got into containment concepts mm-hmm. then you moved on to cooling as the rack loads increased and you moved on to cooling in the row Okay, mm-hmm. that is what you call the in-row cooling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, from this, uh, in terms of hype and noise, mm-hmm. uh, people have moved on to liquid cooling. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have taken a leap from cooling the row to cooling the CPU or immersion cooling, or you want to cool the CPU. Somewhere, we've also forgotten that uh, before we go from the row. Mm-hmm. to the motherboard or we go to the cpu there is an element called a rack mm. okay i think we need to be able to focus on the rack also uh, there are enough technology is available tried and tested what we call the rear door heat exchanger mm-hmm. okay now that's an ideal technology uh, which can scale up so today when we're talking at uh, compute loads okay one of the one of the challenges which data center people face is because the compute loads keep varying okay and as the computer load uh, the compute loads keep varying uh, and keeps increasing at a whatever pace yes. it's difficult for them to predict what's going to happen so you need to have a technology which is scalable mm. okay mm. so which is where uh, rear door heat exchanger comes in mm. so as a thumb rule we can say that uh, if your heat loads are let's say uh, 20 kilowatts per rack and going to 100 120 kilowatts per rack a rear door heat exchanger becomes 
a very good viable option. When you start crossing uh, heat loads of 70, 80 kilowatts and going to 100, 120, 140, etc., plus plus, then you may want to consider liquid cooling. Mm. And it's a more of a practical uh, roadmap uh, purely because a rear door heat exchanger is tried, tested, works, okay, yeah. mm. uh, is stable. Mm. Uh, liquid cooling, as we discussed briefly earlier, is still experimentative. Okay. Uh, there are no standards as yet. Mm. Okay. Uh, there is a whole ecosystem which has to evolve around it. Mm. Uh, and there are enough, I mean, while it is the future, but it has to go through an evolutionary phase uh, before it kind of settles down mm. and uh, becomes some kind of a uh, go-to technology. Mm. Okay. Mm. Mm. So, I don't know. Uh, well, I have no other uh, additional information. <laughs> <laughs> I believe uh, Sanjay already Sorry. mentioned about the cooling, <laughs> how fast the cooling and efficiency <laughs> will become. Well, maybe for you, um, I want to know, because you're in the infrastructure of data center and you have uh, a lot of experience on the differences in implementing cooling solution between HPC and the general sulfurs. Do you... Can you say the differences in general? Yeah, uh, I can say that um, if we are talking the cooling system or requirement uh, will be impacted or will be influenced by uh, some of elements, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, the first element is uh, the country or the ge ge geographical mm -hmm. country, which is uh, we are in tropical area, right? Mm -hmm. It will be different to implement the cooling system with, uh, let's say, in India or in Europe. Mm -hmm. I think it's different. Yeah. So when, uh, since the Indonesia in the tropical, so there's, there are many, uh, you know, may, many cooling methods that we can implement, mm -hmm. mostly in, in data center, as I know, mostly the provider using the um, chill water cooling system. And some DC to implement the IEC, which mm -hmm. is uh, indirect evaporative cooling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to make uh, more efficient in the co in the th in terms of cost or efficiency or implementation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, some DC also, you know, to providing or to implement the uh, direct cooling, you know, the X system. Mm -hmm. That one is depend on your. Uh, company, I believe mm. that uh, one of the DC provider has own uh, basis or uh, basic of design on mm. that, and yeah. how the requirement can can meet the uh, demand requirement on yeah. that, how the efficient and cooling and something like that. As we know, that the cooling system is the second, you know, the second cost uh, will be impact to mm -hmm. the DC um, energy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. huge energy that uh, required for Over cooling system, energy. especially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you talk about uh, tropical countries, then cooling needs are really larger compared to uh, non-tropical countries, as you just mentioned. How do you prevent over engineering or excessive cooling usage? We talk about we have to start from the engineering design first. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, do you have any other additional comments on that? Well, as I know, when uh, you following the international standard for the data the center infrastructure, mm -hmm. I believe that uh, is far, you know, to 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 facing the as you mentioned mm -hmm. the the statement of the offer of cooling or for something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe that there are standard requirement. As I mentioned earlier, that uh, if you are uh, DC provider, you will be uh, you will be for sure that you will be uh, counting about the mm. cost implementation, mm -hmm. efficiency, and something like that mm -hmm. that require and meet the require with this your your client mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. This uh, the simple one. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, let's move to data center design and management. Um, Sanjay, what is the difference between white and gray data center space. Can you explain a bit about this in general? Okay, uh, let me try. I mean, okay. Uh, so, the gray space is basically, how shall I say, 
the infrastructure provision uh, for the white space. White space is where your servers are kept, mm -hmm. okay, where the actual compute capacity and computation mm -hmm. loads and the workloads, mm -hmm. everything happens mm -hmm. in the white space. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the action area. Uh, the gray space is basically a provisioning area. It provides, uh, let's say, your UPS is installed over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Okay, your yeah. cooling systems are installed in there. Your power comes. So basically, your let's say your power comes and rests in the gray space, then it's distributed to the white space. Your mm -hmm. UPS is installed mm -hmm. in the uh, gray space, mm -hmm. and then it's taken to the white space. So white space is very simply put, where the action in terms of the compute capacities, etc is happening and gray space is where the infrastructure for the white space mm -hmm. uh, is kept. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you want to add more on this? I think uh, if we can simplify the gray space is uh, similar with kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the kitchen on the data center. Mm -hmm. So the white space is the food and the containment that we will uh, selling to our Client, yeah. right? Mm. I agree. The white I think space that's a simple yeah. way. Yeah, the white space is a dining table. <laughs> dining table, right. <laughs> Correct. Really serves a uh, different. Yes. <laughs> okay. How does proper data center equipment or placement uh, or arrangement impact sustainability? Oh boy. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> May I? Yes. Please. Sure, sure. First, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So. <laughs> Uh, I over the past few years, I mean, uh, nearly a decade, honestly speaking, uh, I visited a lot of data centers. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> and you, uh, when you walk through data centers, you see racks. Mm -mm. Okay, only uh, racks. <laughs> no, so you see racks, 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 racks. Okay, and then suddenly, not suddenly, and in these racks, you will see that most of them are less than half occupied. Mm -hmm. So the servers are at the top or at the bottom and uh, there's a lot of empty space at the top. You go to the next one, there's another empty space. There. And the first question which comes to mind is, why don't you put the servers from rack two into rack one, mm. consolidate, right? What's happening is by reducing your footprint, you are reducing the operational cooling needs mm -hmm. yep. because you're spreading mm -hmm. yourself to thing. Mm -hmm. okay. So that it's a straight impact which comes into play. So when you talk about equipment placing, etc., uh, there may be still <coughs> be a challenge that you may not be able to mm -hmm. fill up the full rack. Mm -hmm. okay. A lot of times you see, so racks, the servers are put in, let's say, shells, you know, what you call one U, two U, three U when you go up. And you may have three or four shelves which are just lying vacant. Mm. Okay. Mm. Then you see, why are you not blocking or covering that empty space with a blanking panel? Yeah. yeah. Because uh, y the airflow is going through that, right? Mm. Uh, you should be managing the airflow yeah. far better mm -hmm. in that environment. You want to go to uh, traditional data centers. Mm. Okay. Mm. Now, slowly the newer ones are not doing this but the traditional ones which are legacy ones which are still in operation today you had cooling coming from below the floor mm -hmm. okay you had a raised floor cooling is coming from below the floor and the electrical cables were also coming from below the floor mm -hmm. <coughs> so it creates a kind of a mess it's a jungle mm -hmm. below the floor mm -hmm. and that collects dust over a period of time mm -hmm. and then what happens is your uh, airflow movement gets restricted then you're trying to pump in more air more yeah. power to yeah. the cooling. So you're wasting energy, you're wasting resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, So it becomes absolutely uh, critical uh, how you are designing, placing your equipment. And mm -hmm. a lot of people do not realize the fact is one of the most expensive mm -hmm. investments in a data center is the cost of reality, mm -hmm. you know, the floor space. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are putting servers and racks across 20, which you can reduce to maybe five or seven or eight, mm. then <coughs> you're saving that much space, right? So that's a footprint which you're saving. Mm. Mm. And, uh, but people have, I'm saying people have learned, mm. uh, these changes are coming into play yep. because there is constraints on, if you, on you know, uh, operational expenses. You were said right in saying that cooling is the second most uh, 
expensive part mm. of operating expense. So <coughs> people aren't taking changes on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's absolutely critical in terms of design, mm. uh, how and where you place your mm-hmm. uh, equipment. Yeah, it has to start from the design yeah. initiative. The initiative design. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you have any uh, additional comment on this? Yeah, what uh, Pak Sanja mentioned is was uh, to impact uh, for this um, energy, right? Mm-mm. So I believe that uh, technology, as I mentioned, technology is technology is involved, uh, evolve. I mean. Mm. Uh, How to arrange? How you arrange this um, equipment? Not only for the um, gray area, gray mm-hmm. space area equipment, which yeah. is in the kitchen, mm-hmm. and how how we arrange the dining table, which mm-hmm. is the rack, mm-hmm. switch gear, and something like that. You know, mm-hmm. to that one uh, will be impact this cost of energy. Will be impact this uh, manage the airflow, uh, airflow managing. Mm-hmm. You know, airflow managing, mm-hmm. managerial. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, managing. And you know what? Uh, the condition is different right now. It's different with the a couple years ago since mm-hmm. five or ten years. Uh, I believe that uh, when the people mostly <laughs> mostly the people know the people know that if you are built in data center, you will be set up the temperature twenty degrees, twenty three mm-hmm. degrees. Right now is again that uh, related to the energy efficiency, mm. sustainability. People change, yeah. mm. technology change. Mm. You will be able to use the containment, you know, to to you know to focus the cooling system mm. with yeah. uh, inside. The, we have the blinking blinking panel, Blends. something like mm. that, yeah. and then. You also not required the surrounding of the data center outside of the containment mm. is not to you know not to setting up until twenty twenty two degrees twenty four degrees. Some data center is is ready is is, is uh, right now is um, also uh, setting up from twenty four twenty five degrees I believe mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because yeah. there is no point that you are. Cooling the surrounding of the data center, rather than you cooling, you 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 give the cooling system to the to your server, to your dining table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. the point. Yeah, mm-hmm. I yeah. think it's time we had lunch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's very interesting and uh, reducing the carbon footprint. How actually can uh, the number of personnel? Uh, be reduced without increasing the operational risk. Uh, do you think for both of you? This is question for both of you. You know, I'm uh, surprised and happy you're asking this question. Fifteen mm-hmm. mm. years ago, wow. <laughs> uh, we were talking about this concept of what you call lights out data centers. Mm-hmm. Okay, which means. Uh, there'll be no additional lights in the data center. Indeed. You yeah. will not require to have people inside the data center for right. managing in people uh, the data center. So, which were called the lights or data centers. In the technology which was being used, and it's, I'm sure it's still being used now. It is being used now. This is what you call uh, KVM, mm. keyboard video mask control (IP over KVM), and uh, which basically allows to access all your uh, equipment inside a data center remotely and securely. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so the short answer is you could use IP KVMs or uh, serial KVMs to do that, and this technology has been there for nearly 15, 20 years, yeah. and people use it. Mm. The difference is earlier there were analog KVMs, and now IP KVMs have come into play. Uh, this definitely. So if if that is the objective, then KVM is the answer. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So do you have? Do you want to add some more on this? Yeah, this quite challenging since again technology will be evolved, right? So we don't need uh, to have the you know the resource to, to you know to working surrounding surrounding uh, of the data center. Mm-hmm. So we we don't need you know to switch on manually about the lighting of the data center since mm-hmm. we have already sensors. Mm-hmm. When you passing by the yeah. certain point. Yeah. The, the the lamp the light will be switched on automatically yeah, yeah. and when you passing this when we, when you leaving the room or yeah. the point the certain point the light will be switched off mm-hmm. yes uh, in traditional data center yes uh, we facing 10 5 15 years ago right yeah. sanjay but currently again that uh, 
there's two there's there's two you know two you know uh, two things right in the certain point that we might need to reduce mm. everything yeah yeah i agree with you mm. right mm. everything not only the technology mm. not only the uh, because the consumption mm. again we facing also the the dc provider facing also the issue how to reduce the human and all also reducing the energy the uh, the manpower, manpower and everything yes mm. so that one is we can avoid uh, right now since i don't know if future technology again how the how the technology can you know can replacing the yeah. <laughs> the yeah. human or the resources no for see okay so when you want to look at a data center uh, and when we specifically talk about uh, uh, managing a data center remotely yeah it's what you call an incident management uh, process yeah which means if there is some fault which has occurred in a data center and you need to rectify it mm-hmm. uh, there are two choices either you send the person in uh, to go and fix a problem yes yes or you manage the situation remotely now with the kvms uh, you can fix and manage uh, the issues remotely mm. okay even even loading the operating system from a remote location so kvms allow you to do that only if you need to make a hardware replacement let's say you want to take out something okay. physically then you need to send somebody okay okay so this is what you call the incident management cycle and uh, which is why kvms come in mm. uh, just to give an interesting example you know when we talk about data centers we t- typically talk about or in the mind you see these white buildings and land yeah. over here okay but uh, what doesn't come to our mind is uh when you look at oil exploration mm. you have these oil rigs uh, which are far out into the sea mm. right and uh, they have large data centers themselves because mm. they are drilling an oil mm. every equipment and machinery which is running on that rig is managed by some kind of a data center yes. however mm. small it is but it is managed mm. Mm. now imagine if something is going wrong on that oil rig and even one server goes faulty how do you fix it yeah you have to go there <laughs> you send a helicopter <laughs> right mm. so you can send a helicopter and this is a real life case study mm. okay which mm. is what we've done and a mm. uh, helicopter goes there send the person and the engineer, and the engineer and obviously the engineer. Yeah. fixes the problem yeah. and comes back uh, but when the solution of kvm was deployed uh, there was no need for helicopters okay are the kvm uh, uh, have the capability to to solve the problem yes Oh, so okay, so hold on. Okay, okay. hold on. Hold on. Hold <laughs> on. Even on the problem, right? Yeah. No. No. Okay. okay. Hold on. All right. Let me let It's me more let, let me yeah. let me qualify this. KVM is only a tool which gives you access so that it brings you close to the equipment where an incident has occurred okay. as if you are physically there. Mm. Okay. All right. So it gives you so keyboard, video, mouse, KVM. That's what it stands for. Okay. 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 How does it solve the problem? That depends upon who is sitting behind the KVM to solve the problem. I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you put me behind the KVM, problem will never be solved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Since you are behind <laughs> this all, all the time, right? Okay. <laughs> so but if you put a smarter, intelligent person behind a KVM, yes. they can. Yeah. So problem resolution is a is a function of the skill set of the individual behind the KVM. But KVM yeah. will give you physical access uh, to the device as if you are physically. and the beauty of kvm is let's say i you have a problem here today okay mm-hmm. uh, you can get somebody from somewhere within jakarta and ask mm-hmm. the person to come and fix it but suppose you need a more skilled person yeah, yeah. what right. do you do okay the person is not available in jakarta the person is not available in indonesia mm-hmm. but you have a person that's mm-hmm. sitting in singapore yeah. or maybe sitting in us mm-hmm. so you are able to call the person there yeah. give control to the person in yeah. another location mm-hmm. so the access of human capital uh, with the relevant skill set becomes available instantly okay, okay. so how how do you do how do you maintain the security i mean in data center business you are not be able to remote the data yeah. center so Uh, infrastructure uh, outside your or so the data center yeah. so right? yeah. so so you're right that's a brilliant point so first the kvm and the sec- itself has its own secure policies etc mm. and all mm. that plus it complies uh, with the security policies of the organization so sure. it will integrate yes. with your sec 
The third aspect is, uh, so there are certain, so you can segregate two networks, okay? Mm -hmm. One is the internal network internal, yes. and the external network. So you can deploy the KVM in a manner yep. so that your internal security, internal network is not compromised. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it's a valid point, it's a brilliant point, uh, but that's how it's implemented. Okay. Mm. And the beauty of KVM is, uh, I don't know why we are talking about this. This was 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> okay. yeah, we were supposed to be talking something else. But anyway, the beauty of, I mean, I'm, it's such a beautiful tool. I personally love it. Is that in a data center, you do not have one uh, type of uh, servers mm. or from one. I mean, you will not have all HP or all IBM or all Dell or mm. whatever. You will yeah. have a heterogeneous yes. mix of, mix serv of yeah. servers. servers. Mm. Uh, but KVM cuts across all mm. these and you're able to access uh, all the servers oh, irrespective yeah. of who is the hardware provider. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so it gives you that kind of uh, transparent access to mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. So you mean the GVM has the capability to, to you know, to uh, to reading or, 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 I mean, there's a different language between the monitoring system, right, the data center. So this is not monitoring, okay? So it is very simple. It is keyboard with your mouse. It just controls these three ah, signals. Okay. I mean, I mean the, the, the not only the equipment, right? When when you will solve solving the problem, you will do need the network. Sure, you will need that. Right? But, but okay, so here's the advantage here. Okay. Today, when we talk about computers, data centers, we are also talking about edge data centers, yes. yeah. okay, we're talking about going further out into yeah. remote locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest challenge in a remote location? The biggest challenge in a remote location is you do not have skilled manpower to fix a problem right. yeah. on site. Yep. You, you right. don't have uh, infrastructure no. as well. Yeah. So this question, while it is what you've brought it up in KBM, is actually today far more relevant mm. Mm. Uh, to edge data centers. Mm -hmm where you would need KVMs or serial KVMs, depending upon the equipment which is deployed there, to help the organization manage remote infrastructure brilliantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in fact, uh, the use cases or the demands or the questions, uh, this is increasing on this front mm -hmm. a lot more. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Quite interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So in, 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 in infrastructure uh, perspective here, yeah. yeah. uh, Sanjay and Budini, there is changing between, uh, this is related to the IT load mm -hmm. requirement, mm -hmm. changing uh, for a couple years ago mm. until now. Mm. Okay. Uh, when the couple years ago, five, six, seven years ago, when we, when you design the data center, mm -hmm. definitely uh, enough when you alloc accommodate the IT load is not, is, is only for three, five or six KW. Mm. But right now, it's normal, mm. bigger. Mm. So right now, uh, the requirement from the client, most likely the afraid is uh, eight to maybe to 20 KW uh, IT requ requirement. That's one will related, I believe. That's one will related to the GPU or high performance computer mm. and something like that. Mm. You know, what you're saying is so true. Yeah. Uh, the average rack density world over is 8.1 kilowatts today. Yes. Okay. Mm. Uh, if you look at a study done by Uptime Institute, 87% mm -hmm. uh, of the workload is uh, less than 30 kilowatts. Correct. Okay. Now, when you look at another study, if I remember correctly, I think it's done by Omdia Research, uh, and the research goes up till 2027, I think. Yeah. That very clearly states that 90% uh, of the workload will be below 30 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. So while we are talking AI, while we know it is here and it's coming in, but the reality also is that the other applications, traditional applications are also increasing in their volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the simple point or message uh, which I'd like to share is that let's not get uh, defocused with the noise mm -hmm. of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. AI. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, AI is coming. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is here. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is that for the next foreseeable future of three to five years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are pretty much living uh, 
in the compute capacities uh, of less than 30 kilowatts mm -hmm. yeah okay and uh, if i was a data center operator manager uh, what i would like to do is i would mm -hmm. like to understand what my current heat load capacities mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. and plan for another three to five years let's say if my current heat load is 10 12 kilowatts per rack and i'm going to go up to 35 30 mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. kilowatts per rack i need to plan for that mm -hmm. uh, while there is enough noise about 80 100 120 kilowatts per rack mm -hmm. i need to defocus from there i need to focus on my organization where i am yes. what my current loads are and plan for the next three to five years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping a track on short what's happening, but let's not get carried away. Mm -hmm. Okay, with this at this current stage, I would say it's more noise mm -hmm. than reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with this changing of the data center, how data center energy models work in this situation? You think? Well, in my opinion, that the I believe that. The uh, let's say not only data center. We specifically we are talking. If we are talking the mechanical, mm -hmm. there is no rapid, uh, you know, no rapid important or development mm -hmm. comparing with to the IT sectors, right? Mm -hmm. If we are talking the cooling, we are talking uh, how the cooling uh, method and how mm -hmm. the equipment or how these um, maybe uh, compressor or something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 what Pak Sanjay mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that. Again, that the we, we, we are talking the mechanical or the the mechanical uh, transformation is mm. not fast as uh, IT uh, transformation. Mm. If we are calling the if we are talking about the cooling, you are calling you are you are talking about the efficiency, yeah. efficiency and efficiency, mm -hmm. and will be related to the methodology method of the cooling and mm. and something like that in data center mm. area. So uh, again, we are if we are looking if we, if we are talking about how AI transformative the data center. Data center. Yes, AI is, AI is already coming down mm -hmm. even in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. People knows AI, uh, people knows this that the um, application or the software or the equipment uh, for to support these data centers. Uh, for example, Chipos as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. Chipos, BMS, CPM, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. That one is categorized to the um, automation. Mm. I will be related to the how the uh, data, the software can you know support the application to mm. to figure out. That one is different area mm. data center. Mm -hmm. I can say like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So data center energy models work like that. So do you have any 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 additional uh, commentary on that? Uh, Sanjay. Data center energy models. Uh, I know that uh, what I know is that uh, you have tools today by mm -hmm. which you can simulate yeah. uh, your data center workloads, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, do a trial run, demo run <coughs> on a simulated environment and look at an optimal uh, design <coughs> for mm. a data center mm. and uh, because uh, that i mean while it's an initial <coughs> investment it's a lot mm. of investment to be able to simulate the real time workload environment and then mm. you understand the cooling the hair, heat uh, hot spots the uh, airflow movement etc etc so it's a so it's a reasonably accurate model for you to be able to then look upon mm. uh, so it's like testing Mm. So you test design one, design two, design three, figure out what works best for you. Mm -hmm. So those tools are available. Surely they come at a cost, but mm -hmm. I think that cost yeah. is mm -hmm. uh, worth spending. Uh, because once you set up your data center, then it becomes very difficult to be able to mm -hmm. uh, change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have a fairly good idea as to where you're headed with those uh, simulation mm -hmm. models, then you're in a pretty safe hands as to what your next three to five years are going to look like. Mm -hmm. So I, so yeah, that's doable and possible today. Mm -hmm. As the clients of yours, so um, how how can we use uh, less power on this data center? 
this is uh, from the point of view of uh, corporate clients, for example, your end user. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. Mm. Okay. Uh, when you're talking about corporate clients, you're looking at in-house enterprise data centers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, studies show that the average CPU utilization mm. okay, is less than 30%, mm. which means uh, if my CPU uh, is rated at 100, if I can do 100 jobs on that server, mm. I am using it for less than 30 jobs, uh, maybe 20, 25, 26. Mm. Okay. Mm. I'm not using it for the next 70. I mm. have another server, which I'm also using for, let's say, 25, 28. Then I have a third server, which I'm also using for less than 30. Mm. Theoretically speaking, I can combine all three, right? Mm -hmm. And still be operating at about 80 to 90% okay. of utilization mm. on one server, mm. right? Uh, most enterprise data centers operate like that. So, and three servers are obviously consuming ridiculous amounts of energy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So assuming you were to consolidate in one, uh, you're, you're very simplistically speaking, you're consuming one third the energy, mm -hmm. right? Now people want to get into analysis of, uh, uh, in terms of one server utilizing 80, 90% or one server at 30%. But if you look at statistics and graphs, the incremental use from 30% utilization to 70, 80% utilization is far lower than using three servers at 30% yeah. utilization. Yeah. The issue here is mm. people do not know uh, what is the percentage of CPU utilization in their data center. Yeah. They do not monitor it, they do not track it. So if you want to be able to do that, then you need to be able to measure how much CPU utilization, how much power consumption is each server doing. For example, if I have 40 servers in a rack or 30 servers in a rack, how much is each server being utilized then? Mm. And you can only do that if you are measuring power at the outlet level or power at the server level. Mm -hmm. Because once you know how much each server is utilizing power, you will be able to understand as to what is the utilization of that server. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, People don't want to spend money on it. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, to save money, you need to spend money. Yeah. Yeah. Investment. Yeah. So people see it as an expense. You mm -hmm. use the right word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an investment mm -hmm. and not an expense. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can spend hundred thousand dollars, but you will save a million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and there are case studies for that. Is that in the long run or in the short run? Less than two years. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, that's the case studies which we have. We have done it over a period of time, number of clients with a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. uh, we help them analyze their trends and. Uh, so a lot of people, <coughs> let's say, are skeptical. They say, how can you do this? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So we have this small case study with a uh, customer who had 20 racks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we said, okay, try with five. Mm. Don't go with 20. Don't invest in 20. Uh, so he invested in five. Yeah. Tracked it over a period of six months. And mm. he realized the amount of energy he was saving. See, once you track, then you have to make necessary changes. changes. Yeah. So once you do that, you started saving money. Mm -hmm. Then he realized that the money he was saving on the electricity, because of making these changes, he could afford to buy more. more yeah. So while he had budget for five racks, over one and a half years, he was able to finance all 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And after that, it was pure savings through and through. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do you have, uh, do you find challenges when do you see your clients, for example, in Indonesia, in adapting this uh, kind of method? <laughs> issue is not of Indonesia. It's, this is issue is everywhere. Right? Okay. Yes, correct. This is, this is, I would not blame it or put it down or pin it down to one country. All oh, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, this mindset is everywhere. The mm. Okay. Unfortunately, the problem is the people who decide technology. Okay, you've got technical people evaluating, they feel it, they see it, and mm -hmm. they say, yes, they recommend it. But suddenly when it goes to the finance or when it goes to the purchase side. Yeah, CFO. Yeah. So not so much the CFO, it's more the procurement side. They said, oh, we don't need oh, yeah. this. Okay, Starting we don't have budget. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
they will not uh, they see it as an expense they don't see it as an investment yeah okay so somewhere i think uh the synergy between uh the procurement department and the uh, it department mm-hmm. or the uh, technical team has mm-hmm. to be more yeah. yeah both the teams have different objectives mm-hmm. true purchase ties is to reduce expense mm-hmm. you know buy more at same price or less mm-hmm. okay these guys are trying to operationalize maximize mm-hmm. they are trying to do the same thing they are trying to do good things for the organization mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. but their viewpoint is different mm-hmm. they are approaching it from two different ways and we'll support also uh, to the consultant to bridging yeah. both of party right yeah. absolutely yeah. okay so the yeah. consultants play yeah. a very critical role in this uh, they can advocate yeah. they can give advice Correct. and they mm-hmm. can recommend for sure unless yeah. they will not going to heaven a cons- consultant can give you a clear objective uh, yes correct you know, you know the bridging between the, yeah. the 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 it guys or yeah. which is in representative by yeah. for the client mm-hmm. and the dg provider as well mm-hmm. and then the consultant in middle of them mm-hmm. to bridging yeah. all the requirement bridging all the cause as a procurement as sanjay mentioned that procurement guys is talking about the numbers yeah talking about right? numbers and standard it team it guys talking about the requirement mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and a bit of uh, you know spare <laughs> spare yeah. one and something like that mm-hmm. and the client talking about this is me mm-hmm. i will raise uh, raise the po to you and 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 that's the, the supply chain i mean i just uh, uh, the, the 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 you know the procurement the bridging which is the consultant or the it guys and the mm. customer is mm. uh, what we can say the chains of data the center gap, yeah. yes yeah, they need to work closely. in a better yes. yeah they need Correct. to work closely mm. true yep mm. unless we will not uh, meet with the efficiency of the question mm. as you mm. mentioned mm. previously mm. 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 so this is very interesting we go back again to the sustainability then we talk about sustainability goals in data centers first we have maybe a you you may have goals to achieve um, amidst these changes in data center what do you have in mind which one you want well uh, i can give the example of, uh, not not uh, this man i think once of the data center clients or, or, or maybe the clients mm-hmm. if, if i if i can say that uh, for, for example they have they need to they need the power which already has the certification uh, from the government which is the green energy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this one is simple that that happening in here in indonesia right mm-hmm. so uh Thanks God that the right now in Indonesia have some power that uh, representing by DPL and can a bit you know to to certify uh, certify to the DC client that oh the data center is feeding from the green energy which is coming from one of this uh, energy plant located here we have uh, about 200 megawatt something like that and they release the Uh, certification mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that might need uh, require from you as a client mm-hmm. for uh, the uh, green energy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. again that uh, if we are if we are talking this sustainability talking about the investment yeah. the cost of money mm-hmm. the regulator support by yeah. the government the right government, yeah. so i believe that uh, most of the dc provider will be changing to that direction mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i don't know in the future Uh, supporting uh, the green energy is not the dreaming mm-hmm. i hope yeah. that there you will be uh, you know the the dream come true mm-hmm. to here in, in indonesia to provide the green energy but again who knows yeah and yeah. we just uh, uh, you know we just uh, might to the uh, new government here right mm-hmm. now i mm-hmm. think in october will be replacing our president mm-hmm. right to the mm-hmm. new elected president yeah, yeah. and i hope uh, we hope uh, actually that we hope that the, the government uh, not only today and near future and the future will be supporting to the green energy, the green energy. that will be you know will be uh, 
support to the DC provider client, uh, the foreigner client mm-hmm. or multinational client, mm-hmm. many, many add more, you know, to yeah. come down to Indonesia, to Jakarta, to, you know, to open the data center. Yeah, splendid. Yeah. yeah. Splendid. Okay. Sanjay, do you have Well, no, the, the only thing I'd like to add to uh, what Vishnu was saying was, I mean, I agree with him that the government will play a huge role. Uh, yeah. Regulatory environment, and I think that is absolutely critical. Uh, I am not doubting the intent of data center managers, operators, owners that uh, they want to go on a sustainable path. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, but the reality of the situation is there are business needs which sometimes push yeah. to people to make decisions which are not necessarily in favor of environmental mm. or sustainable mm. Yeah. Mm. goals. Okay. Mm. Uh, so you need an external intervention uh, to help those things. I mean, mm. we all know Singapore uh, put a moratorium on data centers for nearly two and a half, three years. Mm. And now they've opened up and they've set up a uh, operational efficiency goal, which says you have to operate data centers at this level. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So that there is a external body government in this case yeah. which is demanding uh, efficient operations mm-hmm. uh, so that is i believe very critical uh, for this to mm. move ahead mm. on their own uh, it's going to be even more difficult mm. yeah mm. yeah yeah thank you pa wisnu pa sanjay um, thank you so much thank you, so much. thank you for sharing the insights and very uh, knowledgeable um, insight from both of you in this empowering the future of sustainability in the data center so uh, we hope we hope today's uh, conversation can provide benefits for all of us and uh, before we close this episode uh, may we give a uh, salam unity salam, salam unity. unity enjoyed this podcast take it with you on the go find us on spotify and never miss an episode Just search for New Santara Academy on Spotify and hit follow. Happy listening! Let's connect with fellow data center industry expert. Join our community at Lincoln New Santara Digital Community to collaborate, share insights, and stay informed about the digital world right now.